The world is at a pivotal crossroads in its energy transition, driven by ever-increasing electricity demand. Governments have been re-evaluating their energy strategies and climate policies. The focus now on affordability and economic growth over sustainability. CNA's Rani Santani has been speaking to policymakers and industry leaders at the Milken Institute Asia Summit here in Singapore, and she joins us live now. Uh, Rani, have there been any notable developments on the climate front? Well, Paul, this is just day one of the Milken Institute Asia Summit. Later today, policymakers and experts will be looking at the challenges of financing climate adaptation. If we look at where we stand, uh, despite Asia's net zero pledges and plans for clean energy solutions, coal still powers a majority of the region's electricity. Governments have been taking efforts to reduce emissions, but of course there are multiple hurdles. From high energy demand, as you mentioned, this is for economic growth, but there's also uneven regional development. The rise of AI is also posing a big challenge with the tech requiring an immense amount of electricity to power data centers. Now to help us understand more about the situation in Asia, Oyi Chu, the CEO of Climate Impact X, joins me now. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with me. Thank you for having me. Let's start off with where does Asia stand when it comes to climate action? Well, that's a very interesting question because I think um, there is a lot of development and thinking around climate uh, right now. If you look at the number of events and conferences that are happening, New York Climate Week, um, Eco Sparity in Singapore, London Climate Week, we had Impact Week, and now Milken, a big um, part of the agenda has become around climate and sustainability. So I would say that there are a lot of constituencies and stakeholders that are coming together to try to make this work. Now, I think the four main stakeholders today are governments, uh, shareholders, investors, um, consumers and customers, and financial institutions. And all of these have different approaches, but they all need to come together and really make it work. And I would say that right now, I, uh, the will is to get this done is very, very high. Because I think we've all recognized that we've busted past the 1.5. I mean, there's just nowhere that you know says we're actually close to 1.5. And so countries that are very impacted potentially by climate change are now sort of rallying together and saying, well, you know, we really need to get together globally and solve this problem. Part of the issue, even though with the best efforts, is there's a lot uh, going on at the moment, right? There's a lot of geopolitical volatility. There's a lot of economic uncertainty. Uh, and so I think this plays into the, the decision making of, of all the four stakeholders. You know, we uh, talk about, let's say in the region, every country is trying to balance economic growth with the cost of sustainability. And I think there are uh, still ways that we can mobilize capital but it would need all four constituencies to come together uh, to really act together. And we must remember, Asia is not homogenous, right? We're made up of many, many countries, and um, each country has its own cadence and speed of trying to enact and putting down regulations that make and uh, mobilize capital from uh, developed countries to developing countries. So where do you think we're lacking? What have we not done in terms of climate action? I think it's not so much about lacking, but it is around the speed at which these things uh, are, are, are sort of put in place. And when you have other considerations, for example, uh, economic uh, uncertainty, this gets placed a little bit behind the agenda. Uh, does that mean that it's? A, does that mean that everyone's ignoring it? I think the answer is no. But I think everyone's trying to balance. You know, this delicate balancing. And it's not just government; it's corporate as well. When you're facing a lot of economic headwinds, the question is, you know, where do I spend that allocation of dollar? Because it is an extra dollar. I think what will happen over time is generally there is a broader recognition of climate risk. What does that do to impact businesses and governments? Then I think, you know, there'll be a bit more thinking around mobilization of capital. What is right now happening is every country is developing their own mechanisms in climate bills or in carbon mechanisms. And every country uh, wants to solve right now for their own emissions and their own issues. How do they meet their own NDCs? How do they create the infrastructure to track their own inventory and how to solve that? That itself takes time.
right? And I think once that happens, we will then start to think about what is the global connectivity. So for example, uh, the UNFCCC will meet and announce some big things in COP hopefully, and they're developing uh, mechanisms for Article 6.4, which is a sort of more globally standardized carbon credit mechanism. And again, uh, this takes time because it, you need the different countries to uh, negotiate and agree as well. So I don't think it is so much lacking. It's not a zero uh, for sure, but I think the pace is somewhat slowed down. But I, we do see a lot of energy coming back uh, and trying to pick this up again because we are in an urgently needed situation to mobilize trillions of capital to make this work. It's an urgent situation, as you mentioned. So what kind of projects have you been seeing in Asia that have really been tackling the climate crisis in that sense, or moving towards clean energy? Well, I think we see in Asia a lot of nature-based projects, um, and I think these are really exciting. I think in the region, in Southeast Asia, we see a lot of, for example, uh, peatland projects or reforestation projects in Indonesia. We have that in Malaysia as well. So I think ASEAN in particular is quite rich uh, with a lot of these nature-based projects. Um, globally, we see much more technically advanced projects like direct air capture that's more uh, in the US and Europe, and these are very very exciting as well. And I would say, you know, we, I think that the world needs all of the above um, types of projects from nature all the way to engineer and, you know, sort of irrespective of the cost discussion behind that and the cost of the carbon credits behind that, because I, I, I think that we need, to, we need to have a whole slew of solutions to make it work. Um, you know, in the region, China is also a very large uh, country and it is establishing its own uh, uh, carbon uh, protocols. And I think that's also a very exciting space to watch because obviously China is very advanced in the technology side, but also they have a lot of opportunities these developed nature-based projects. Speaking of technology, I want to look at the role of AI. Do you think this is an impediment or a catalyst for sustainability? It is. Um, AI is so um, polarizing in, in the climate space, really. But it is, again, part of this economic growth discussion and, and the corporate growth discussion. AI um, in itself, uh, it's obviously um, sort of the bad boy, you know, that's sort of causing all the data centers to, you know, explode in growth uh, in, in a good way. But it also means that it needs a lot of power and a lot of water to sustain the growth. And, um, but having said that, I think that AI on the flip side of that is a huge enabler. I mean, it's not just about sustainability and it's not just about climate, uh, as in trying to get AI to enable some of the tools to facilitate that, but it's also a globally sort of recognized tool to help corporates, right, be more efficient, just get up to speed. Uh, in the climate world, I think it's still, I feel it's still underutilized. I think AI could have a lot of adaptability into understanding and modeling, for example, for climate. Uh, in understanding and modeling carbon projects, we have very unique technical characteristics. And so sometimes when you see the thousands of projects out there, it's quite bewildering, right? So how does AI then help, you know, see through some of the good projects uh, that corporates might want to invest in, et cetera, et cetera. We look at AI, so for example, in um, carbon pricing, how does that help analytics? How do we get better transparency and discovery in, in pricing? So there's a lot of use cases and enablers on the business side even though, you know, on the other side, it's sort of causing quite a lot of stress because, you know, the power needs are, it's a very power hungry sector. But net net, I mean, I hope to see more uh, um, AI enabled tools to really grow the climate uh, capabilities. As, uh, so so space, you think yeah. there's a way we can align our climate goals with the use of AI in that sense? Well, I mean, AI to some extent is sort of more than climate, right? It, it, it is growing because uh, there's a lot of corporate and business need uh, around around it and that's why it is growing. We do see a lot of technology uh, players in this world actually understanding that delicate balance between the AI growth and they're actually deploying a lot of capital into carbon markets. So to some extent, um, I think it, it, it hopefully is a net win-win for the world when you can create a technology to better enhance uh, what we do in the climate space. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. We were speaking to Oi Chu, CEO of Climate Impact X.